what are we cooking today? Or better yet, what's for lunch? When I talk about beans, it's something that's very nutritious and known in different parts of the world. I myself grew up eating every kind of beans, and I bet you that you've seen black pinto, red garbanzos, black-eyed peas, anything fun and nutritious. Beans can be in a stew, beans can be a salad, beans can be fun. Not only they are nutritious, but in New York, we had an explosion of what I called bowl places where you choose your rice, your beans, meaning your protein, your carbs, your greens, and you make your beans uh, in your salad. So give you two tips to make your beans cook nicely and softer. One is soak them overnight. You want them to be completely covered in water. The next morning, you should rinse it and then put it in a pressure cooker. Now, the second tip is buy the pressure cooker. Okay, you will need it. You're going to use it for many other dishes. You can use them to make stew. You can use them to make grits and anything that needs to be softened, even yuca, it's easier to cook in a pressure cooker than on the stove for three hours. But let's go to our weekly menu. Monday, orecchiette pasta with blue cheese sauce. Tuesday, Manhattan salad, what is lettuce, tomatoes, red onions, cucumbers, and grilled cheese. And I mean grilled chicken by that. Wednesday, asparagus and pirizettos. Thursday, pork wine with Brussels sprouts. And Friday, rice beans and pepper steak. What are we cooking today? And today we're having fun with Kayla. Kayla cooks. I'm going to let her start. I'm Nadia Cooks, but Cooks is not my last name, okay, people? So that you know, Cooks is because I cook and I love cooking. But Kayla's going to tell us her story. She's an amazing girl I met online many years ago through that other social media website that doesn't exist anymore uh, called Orkut, I think. And then we moved on to Facebook and we moved on to calling each other. And she's been a great inspiration. She does everything and anything and she is amazing. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. Kayla, it's up to you. Tell us about your departures, your arrivals. It's a pleasure to have you here. The mic's all yours. Nadia, thank you so much for inviting me to participate on your podcast. I'm very happy to be here cooking with you today. I am Kayla. I am from Sao Paulo, Brazil. I am the head chef and co-owner of Casa Brazil, which is a Brazilian restaurant here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, we specialize in Brazilian home style Brazilian cooking. A lot of people got to know Brazilian food abroad by the Brazilian barbecue, by the churrasco. However, we bring a Casa Brazil, we bring a little different flavors or twists to Brazilian cuisine, as we call. So I am very excited to talk to you today. And if I forget something, please. <laughs> It's okay, Sometimes it's okay. Are, uh, Kayla, tell us how did you end up in Pittsburgh? Still city. I am in, I've been in Pittsburgh for about eight years now. Okay, where were you before? I was in Clary in Pennsylvania, which is about two hours north from Pittsburgh. Uh, that's a university town. That was my second city uh, that I lived in the U.S. Um, once I left Brazil, or once I left Sao Paulo, I went to Atlanta, Georgia, and there I stayed for about maybe six months or so, and then I moved to PA, uh, to Pennsylvania later in 2006. So I've been in the U.S. for about 14 years total, and that pitch break eight years. And did you cook before getting to Pittsburgh? I've been cooking for a long time. No, I've been forget I've about... I never went to culinary school or anything like that. It was okay. just everything I learned from my family. I started cooking, I was probably like seven, six, seven years old when I did my first uh, pot of rice, which is a major thing in Brazilian cuisine. You need to know how to make rice and beans. So little by little, uh, at home, I started cooking a little bit more to help my, my family. My mom was always working, so I'll be home responsible for making at least my lunch or my dinner sometimes and then as I grew up I started cooking cooking more and then when I moved to the U.S. I was already cooking a whole lot but always like for the family never like commercializing food or nothing like that when I graduated from college in 2012 that's when I did like my biggest party in the U.S. so far like cooking for a huge amount of people just mm -hmm. about 40 people and I was brave enough to make feijoada right before that people started saying hey your food tastes really good why don't you sell it and this and that but it was difficult having a small child being in college so I just kept on cooking making my own you know my own things visiting like uh, revisiting some recipes from family recipes and everything uh, 
I started like professionally cooking, like commercialized, selling my food back in 2014. Kayla, how hard is it to find ingredients and good ingredients and anything Brazilian related or Latin? I know, like rice and beans, you can find it almost in everywhere in this country now, right? But what about the rest? Now it's much, much easier than it was 14 years ago. <laughs> that a lot of people shop, a lot of their Brazilian supplies through, uh, that it makes it easier. But uh, back when I started, it was really difficult, like learning the ingredients, good replacement and testing recipes and learning the measurements. That was something that was super challenging to me. You know, um, I grew up like using, um, using kilos, milliliters, milliliters and all that stuff. And then you have to use ounces, pounds, and I'm like, oh no, my brain's not functioning in the temperature. Like the oven is not 180 Celsius, but it's at 400 Fahrenheit. So the ingredients today, I'll say that is easier to find. We try to use as many local products as possible. Mm -hmm. So vegetables are pretty staple mm -hmm. in the sense of Brazilian cuisine in here. So it wasn't so difficult. Our, a lot of our dishes like are plant-based. Not, not that we are vegan or vegetarian. Mm -hmm. No, we're very inclined to that. But that makes a little bit easier. But there's some ingredients like, for example, farinha to make the farofa. That's mm -hmm. the one that is still a little bit hard for us. Pittsburgh now has its first Brazilian um, supermarket, which is a tiny little thing. Nice. It, ha it helps a lot. It helps a lot. And it's not nothing compared to other cities because I know like Boston, you can find ingredients pretty much everywhere you go or to go down to Orlando. New York has the same. But I hear Pittsburgh sometimes you still have to depend on coming from outside uh, that I cannot find here. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. And, you know, I have to tell you, uh, Brazilian cuisine is so beautiful and it's so rich and it's from all over. So last night, thanks to you, I was watching the street foods on Netflix and then we had to explain to Stella what was, uh, you know, like the Northeast, how the Northeast is different from the South because she was really surprised. Not that, look, I make moqueca, I may, I don't make acarajé, but I make moqueca and I make bobo, okay? So that is easy and fine because remember, we're from the South, right? So we can eat anything, meats at all at any time but I had to explain to her and, and, sh and she loved watching the episode and I thought so much about you because you know you really represent what is not a high class restaurant Brazilian food but what is to me sometimes might be even better because it's home cooked with love right and it's your roots and it's who you are doesn't it make you feel good to know your identity now yes it feels great Nadia <laughs> um, when, when I came to the realization that's the what I like to do and that's what I do best. I always I joke that I say that I cook the food that your grandma would cook if she was Brazilian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because of that food, that comfort food, like with lots of love, like lots of seasoning, and that will remind you of home. And that was one of the things that I missed the most when I moved to the U.S. Because, for example, Churrasco, we have like the barbecue at home. Sometimes like once a month. I'm from Sao Paulo, the southeast, so we do eat meat. Brazilian cuisine involves a lot of meat in the south a little bit more. Mm. But uh, what I'm tr trying to say is that a barbecue was not the center of the cuisine that I grew up eating. Like, it was that rice and beans mixture, and then you have a little salad or veggies, like mm. cooked veggies or chicken and beef, pork or something. And that was something that I missed so much when I moved. I started cooking. I remember the first pot of rice that I made here was terrible <laughs> because the apartment that we were leaving, the stove was electric. It was the, my first time ever cooking an electric stove. I can't. And then... I can't, I can't, I can't. I'm sorry. Keep going. It was so hard, and I made it, and the wa everything to me tastes different. The water tastes different, the salt yes. tastes different. So, like, although it was rice, although I used the garlic, the onions, oh, whatever, exactly the same recipe, but I couldn't eat that. And my friends were like, no, that tastes amazing. <laughs>
Yeah, and I think that's why your friend said, oh my God, it's so amazing. I go through the same thing and I've never been a, a fan of rice, but so that you know, during the pandemic now, we went to a small Portuguese supermarket because there's a Portuguese community in a few towns over by like 15 minutes away. So we went to this small, they have a small supermarket. They sell a lot of European products that we love, right? Because the quality is better than whatever rice from here and, 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 and things like that. So I asked Felipe to bring me rice home because I can't take parboiled rice. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, it's I just can. me. It's just me. <laughs> But then he brought home a bag of rice from São Borja. It's, it's not from São Borja. It's from the smallest town near São Borja. São Borja is almost at the border of Rio Grande do Sul, right, in Argentina. Yeah. Kayla, it's the best rice. It's called Prato Fino, okay? It comes from that very small town. And it's funny because we have a friend who was born there, but he grew up in Minas. So every time we talk, when he opened his mouth and he said, I'm a gaucho, and I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> You're from Minas. He said, no, but you have to understand. I was there until I was six. And I said, no, it doesn't make you a gaucho, okay? You... <laughs> And it's so funny because he said, Nadia, come on, don't judge me. And I'm, and I said, no, I'm kidding, Alex. But he was the one, and I have to thank him on air, that he was the one who told me, try the rice, try the rice. If you, It's really hard to find. It's really hard to find. But it has a taste. And it has a taste of rice. And you will only understand it once you try it. It's very different from any other rice I've ever... And again, I'm not a rice person. I don't uh -huh. need rice to survive. I can eat polenta my whole life and it's going to be fine. See? But... <laughs> If you have a chance, uh, try to find it on Amazon. And by the way, Kayla, I forgot to tell the people who are listening to us. Uh, just a heads up, Kayla's in Pittsburgh and I'm in New York. So this is over the phone. It might not be the best audio that you guys ever heard, but we're trying our best to make, you know, to have our story heard in different parts of the world. Because next thing you know is you have a friend who lives in Asia and they're listening to us. So that's the, the fun part of being a part. Yeah, the Prato Fino, if my memory doesn't fail, that was one of my dad's favorite brand of rice. Aww. Uh -huh. Yeah. At the restaurant we use Jasmine rice, it works fine. I mean, because the way we have to buy so much. Yeah, <laughs> of course. You cannot buy a little bag of Prato Fino. Uh -huh. Yeah, we probably go through about a hundred pounds of rice in the week. So we need like the big quantities. And that was the part of the learning, the ingredients that are replacement mm -hmm. for traditional ones. And a long time ago, I used basmati rice, mm -hmm. but that's very like flavorful and aromatic. So it was yeah. a little bit too much for my recipes. But the jasmine rice has been working fine so far. So, okay. So before we even go any farther, I have to tell people that I love Kayla because she's just like me, has her Monday to Friday job. But unlike me, she has a restaurant and I will do catering over the weekends. She, Kayla goes to work Monday to Friday, goes to the restaurant Monday to Sunday and takes care of her son full time. Now, <laughs> what, okay, so adapting is part of life. What else did you have to adapt? And, you know, if you have to start over, what would you do different? Well, one thing that I had in mind when I started, I got into cooking, like, uh, like I said, 2014, that's when I started selling food to my co-workers at the location that I was working at the time. I would take their orders on Friday, and then on Sunday I'll cook everything, and Monday I'll deliver the lunch. One thing that I always had in my mind was do what you can, what you have. I started small because I knew that's all I could do. For example, even for the lunches that I would deliver, I would have like a fat menu, so that way I didn't have to cook four or five different dishes for like different people, mm -hmm. and then spend like the whole day in the kitchen just cooking and then make just a little bit of money so I started like slow Mm -hmm. one step at a time. I understand. And then people sometimes ask me, why are you not doing this? Why not? And I say, look, just because I still cannot leave my Monday through Friday job, as you know, <laughs> health, yeah, but look, healthcare, it's a disaster and it's super expensive. You don't want to get hurt because God knows how much money you need to have in a bank to pay for your bills, right? You really try to live your life as best as you can. But if you don't have something stable, it's really hard to start. And if you don't have a large backing and funding, it's It's even more complicated. I also think that you have a good an advantage point is you don't have that many competitors in your town, right? It's not like here. If you in New York City, not in Manhattan, but in the boroughs, there are so many Brazilian restaurants now that you know it's hard to stand out. And you know, everything in New York is expensive, but you're in you're in Pittsburgh. It's a smaller town. Not only it's a smaller town, but you have less of the diversity and you have less competitors. How hard it is to get people to come out and try new things. Just to finish the last question between everything 
restaurants, my personal life and the full-time job, it's not easy. And I, when I said I used to do like you, I used to do most of my catering over the weekend because that was the only time that I had availability. And then uh, throughout the time, the order started getting more and more and more. And that's when a couple of years later, the restaurant idea came aboard. I was just able, and I'm just able to the restaurant as of today and to keep my full-time job is because I have a business partner mm-hmm. uh, that I help with everything because I said <laughs> when the chance to open the restaurant came, I said to myself, okay, I'm crazy enough <laughs> <laughs> to open a restaurant, but I'm like, I'm not that crazy to sit on my own. <laughs> so yeah. I decided to partner with a former project partner and friend as well who jumped on board, is American, never been to Brazil yet, but a lot of Brazilian food and uh, every day gets to make up. People think he's Brazilian. Ah, that's nice. Um, <laughs> yes. And that, that's an advantage, too, that we have here in Pittsburgh. Like, we are the first home-style cooking restaurant because the first, first, very first was in a steakhouse here just closed after, mm-hmm. t- after 20 years with all the pandemic that they, co- they had to shut down for a couple of months and then try to open back again, and then it didn't work. But uh, there are a couple other steakhouses, but uh, what we do, we are unique. And I think that's definitely our advantage. And the fact that Pittsburgh is becoming more of a foodie town compared to other places. It's two years behind of New York, but I think little by little. I remember our restaurant, uh, Casa Brazil, we started as a pop-up restaurant in a sense that we wanted to test the waters and try our restaurant concept to see if it worked. The problem that I had from before, if they were going to come to me where, wherever I was. So we started as a pop-up, and I remember one day when when I was explaining right before we opened the concept to somebody, the girl said, oh my gosh, that's so New York. I said, ah, no. yeah, Pittsburgh. <laughs> and then you yes, just I'm bringing the idea here. And it worked because opening a restaurant, opening a business is so expensive. Mm-hmm. And uh, the odds are against you yes. when making profit of food is not easy. Mm-hmm. So we said, you know, let's open as a pop-up and see how it goes. And people got to know us on that year. So after the year came about, we decided that we wanted to stay. And uh, we are here and to stay and it's still expanding and everything. Uh, that's nice. That's nice. We're very happy. I'm very happy for you. You know this. I've been a supporter from the very beginning. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. Kayla, before we go, what do you miss from home? If you miss anything, and but wait, but where's home now? <laughs> I always say that uh, I expect we are always in limbo. Like, if we're here, we are missing something from home, and then we get home, then, like, okay, it's the time to go back home, home. <laughs> yeah, right? Don't you feel that you have, a, a, you have two homes? You have home here, and you have home in Brazil. But then, cool. once you're here, you miss the things from Brazil. I think, like, you can see, today, cuisine, it's not so hard. Music, come on, we got on Spotify, and we can listen to whatever we want. There's YouTube and all of that fun stuff. You develop friends friendships but then but you still miss your family and you miss uh i think everything has a uh, to me places have a sense of smell i have a high sense of smell right so to me places smell completely different then you go yeah. to brazil and then you like it but on the like usually to me by the third day i miss home yeah <laughs> <laughs> same here i do miss a lot of things like i grew up in a small farm so having that easy access just to the land where I am now here, like, I am a little bit outside of Pittsburgh, so I have a little bit more access, like, to green in my backyard and all that stuff. So I think that's one of the things that I miss. Food-wise, I miss something called Garinha Caipira, which is, like, a mm. cage-free chicken, which doesn't taste the same. I haven't been able to find anything the same here in the U.S. so far. But it's that chicken that you grow pretty much, I mean, that you raise in mm-hmm. your backyard, and uh, you do the whole process, and it tastes so So, 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 so good. I say move to a place where you can have a chicken coop. I still can't. I've been trying to convince my husband for the longest, but he doesn't let me have a chicken coop in the backyard. He told me I can have my I can have my little vegetables in the summer, and that is it. Okay, so. <laughs> It's a lot of work. I don't know. I, I know, I know.
know, my father has a farm, right? And But we grew up in the South. Everyone had a grandparent. You lived in a big enough of a house that in the backyard, you had trees and you had veggies and fruits. And then you had a chicken coop with a, with a, with a few chickens. And you, need, you had eggs every morning, right? And you had eggs every yep. day. It's good that you have the opportunity to talk about it. So you know, and Amir knows that your son knows that food doesn't come from a package in a supermarket. But at the same time, you know, how can we adapt? I don't think we can adapt the chicken coop in our lives. <laughs> I don't think so. And even it's funny because a couple years ago, every time when I go back to visit, my mom will always get me one. Uh, they don't raise chickens any. I mean, my mom doesn't raise chickens anymore. But my sister-in-law who lives like around. She does. And uh, but uh, her chickens are just so cute that uh, I don't think I, I am ready to cook. If it, they give to me the chicken ready to go to be cooked, I'll be glad to do it. But it's hard to process from scratch. <laughs> you will not be able to kill it. That's okay. I, I know. <laughs> Have someone else do the dirty job for you, Kayla. Just deliver <laughs> <laughs> deliver the killed chicken and then you can do it from there on. <laughs> it's funny, but it's true. I remember like, I think a couple of years ago when I went to Brazil uh, and we went to the farm and then Stella went to pick up eggs and then my dad said, oh, Stella, let's find a chicken so we can have lunch. And then she got with a question mark in her face and I say, just keep going, just keep walking, right? Just get your eggs. And then I think it's how people are used to do this. They will kill the chicken without nothing. And then all of us and she just looks at she looks at my my father my father has the chicken dead already right hanging and then she said that was it like that was I didn't see anything uh, that was so fast how did that happen it, and and I know it's when we tell the story to other people they're like your father killed the chicken I said people you have to understand you know it was alive at once it didn't show up in your supermarket magically it doesn't come from a plant it comes from the coop right it comes yeah. from other places but I think it's the way that people do and the old ones are so used to it that to them it's yeah. just like okay we're gonna wash our clothes and put them on again so they just go they kill the chicken and they're used to it that's a nice way to put it yeah and we are the ones that are sometimes so worried about everything but that's a conversation for another time Kayla I'm gonna let you go because I know you have a full time job I'm on my break and it's a beautiful day today we have to enjoy I want to thank you for your time before we go give us your handle you on on Instagram because I know it's Casa Brasil in Pittsburgh. Do you a website, anything that can help us locate you? We are located in Highland Park. That's right by the zoo. And our handles are Casa Brasil PGH. P is in Peter, G is in Gary, H is Hotel PGH for Pittsburgh. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And the mine is Kayla Cook, but Kayla with a twist, the, the Brazilian way of Kayla. It's K-E-Y-L-A Cooks on Instagram and Facebook as well. Oh, that was so nice. Thank you so much, Kayla. We're going to see you next time around. Please come back, okay? And if you come to New York, I will not make a barbecue for you. I promise to make polenta, soft one, mm-hmm. with the chicken liver, chicken liver, chicken hearts, everything uh, in sauce on top. You're going to love it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but I want a carajé, please. Just saying. Oh, <laughs> I'd love to, but I'm making a carajé. That's something going to have to wait a little more here. It's because okay. In Brazil, you can find the beans pretty much like 50% yeah. done, and then you just have to finish the process. Here, you have to start from scratch. So, maybe yeah. not yet, but maybe one day. <laughs> one day, we're going to go on vacation, okay, to your town, and then you take the day, and then you make it from scratch. I'll help you out. Don't worry. I would love it. I would love to do it. Let's do it. Uh, we'll cook together. Kayla, thank you so much again. I'll see you next time, okay? You're welcome. See you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Nadia.